So some of the risk factors that have been identified to things that you can try to prevent or uh, mitigate maybe the potential for developing the disease. If you have EHV virus and susceptible horses, so horses that haven't been vaccinated, and we'll get to the vaccine here in a minute, okay? If you have a horse that's infected and shedding in the, the farm, increases the risk of other horses, obviously. There is a seasonal variation. We see more of these cases in the fall, winter, and in the springtime. Summer is not usually a problem, so springtime is one of the times we certainly see it, so it read the book. High fevers. So that's why, again, monitoring that temperature twice a day can be very, very important. So very high fevers. So these that are greater than 103 and a half consistently and that we see these high fevers several days after the onset of fevers. Okay. So the typical viral problem, they have a fever for 24, 48 hours and then it returns to normal in most cases. So the horse that pro has a prolonged sort of a febrile response, that they have this high fever several days after you had noted this initial onset, those are the horses that are more likely to develop the neurologic form of, of herpes. Okay. Having the neurotropic variant increases the likelihood, it's not necessary or absolute, but it does increase the likelihood that you will see the neurologic form of the disease. Stressors. So, Shipping, commingling, moving to a new farm, all those sort of things can be considered stressors. Another disease that they may be dealing with can be considered a stressor. And that's where we get into this viral latency and recrudescence or the disease coming out at that point. There are geographic differences. If you want to be safe, move to New Zealand. They've had very few cases, so you could move your horse there until the outbreak's over and bring them back and be just fine. So they've had very few outbreaks there. <clears throat> Adding new horses to a herd between the stress and also potentially bringing in the disease itself. Okay? Age, as we already mentioned, as far as older, older animals. We also see breed and gender differences. Okay? Mares seem to be more at risk, as well as some of the breeds, pony breeds and lighter breeds are actually less likely to have the problem, okay? So there are some differences in what we've seen with epidemiologic studies. <clears throat> so where does the virus hide? How does this develop, okay? So this viral dormancy, this latency that I keep alluding to, that's very, very important when we start looking at herpes, okay? So They've, they've looked at studies as far as trying to document how many horses truly are latently infected or have the virus present in their body that a stress can cause it to come out. And the numbers are anywhere from about 70 to 80 percent roughly in that range that they expect to have happen or that they expect that can be uh, latently infected. This occurs within the first few weeks of life, so there's nothing you can do to prevent this, okay? It's just, it's going to happen as a foal in most cases and around, again, depending on which study you want to look at, somewhere between around 66 percent, 60 percent, up to about 80 percent. So you can pretty much assume that the horse is probably latently infected. The majority are going to be, okay? It's shared in respiratory droplets. So any sort of moisture from the nose can carry those viral droplets, okay? It's not in manure, it's nowhere else, it's in the, the, the viral particles there in the nasal secretions, okay? You can also find it in aborted fetuses and the placenta. So again, if you have an abortion, at least keep that in mind. The viral shedding becomes important when we start looking at prevention, okay, isolation. We see that horses that have the neurologic form, even after they're showing improvement, can still be shedding for 21 days or longer. Okay, so that's why when we start talking about isolation, 28 days is sort of the minimum that you should look at with a horse that's actually had the disease, and 21 days is really what you should look at for isolation as just far as uh, preventing it in, in uh, some of our prevention sort of measures. With the respiratory form, it's much shorter. So there really is a difference in how this virus behaves when it, even, even the, 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 the non 
neurotropic one can still shed for that length of time when it's involved with causing the neurologic form. So again, this latency and this recrudescence or the disease redeveloping is really very important to developing the, the neurologic form. Because we can see this in closed herds. Okay? I've had this before where people tell me they haven't taken their horses anywhere, they've had no horses come into their property, and now I'm telling them that their horse has herpes myelencephalopathy and it can occur because of this latency where some sort of stressor has caused this virus to recrudesce, to start to replicate, and as such it starts to spread in their body and can create these signs. So there's a good chance that this case there in Utah was just this. Shipped this horse in, wasn't showing any signs, didn't have the virus beforehand, that stress of the travel coming to the show caused recrudescence of the disease, and there it goes. Okay, so that's why when you bring in new horses into your facility, isolation is really critical. Okay? There's been discussion about subclinical disease and how important that may possibly be. It probably is not that important in truly the spread of this disease. The recrudescence of latent infection is far more important for the development of the herpes myelencephalopathy. Okay? When we see adult horses becoming infected, Again, we're seeing clinical signs, whether it's some respiratory or abortion, or we're concerning, obviously, the myelencephalopathy. So where does this, this variant originate from? Is there only one variant or only certain horses carrying that? So we can see that horses are, are harboring that, and they don't have to have had the neurologic signs. Okay? They can have that variant, they can have that mutation, and not have ever had neurologic signs, okay? They're just harboring that virus. Or we can see the, the spontaneous mutation between what we consider the low risk variant, okay, our more normal EHV1 that causes respiratory forms. We can see a spontaneous mutation in that horse. It doesn't have to mutate and move to another horse or move to another horse and mutate there. And it can go back and forth. They can have them go from one form and back to the other again. Okay. So those are two at least of the speculative reasons or how they can come up with the, 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 uh, the, the virus being there. So as far as where the virus hangs out, it's on uh, the trigeminal nerve, if you want, for cocktail trivia. It's the trigeminal nerve ganglia is where it hides. Okay. And again, some sort of stress causes that virus to start to replicate and begin to spread, okay? And the shedding without clinical signs is really important when we start looking at the neurologic form. And again, that's my guess that probably what happened there in Utah, this horse was stressed, was shedding it, and wasn't showing any signs itself. Now, had they been taking temperatures, they might have seen this horse have a fever. Can't say for sure. So then, again, these closed populations are still at a risk because of that. <clears throat> so how is it transmitted? Again, direct contact because it is in those nasal secretions. Okay. Contact with any horse that's shedding, so nose to nose. If they're sneezing and coughing, horses can actually propel droplets quite a few feet, 30-some feet at least, when they sneeze and cough. So if you think you've got them isolated by just keeping them in one corner of the barn, it can get aerosolized very easily, okay? Direct contact with aborted fetuses can certainly lead to that, okay? The respiratory mucosa, again, is where it's hiding out. The incubation period, okay? Two to eight days for the rhinopneumonitis or the respiratory form. Two weeks to months for abortions, okay? And you can see it's longer for that neurologic form, up to about 10 days is what we figure, at least for the incubation period. So that's why, again, when you start looking at isolation, if you're going to say, I'm going to isolate this horse for seven days, and then you say, it can get out now, well, there's still a possibility that this could be one that's going to start showing up signs later. So be careful when you start thinking about isolation and prevention, okay?